in Genesis 2, and uh, we're looking at the garden for the man, a very specific place that God creates then as uh, we've been looking at the days of, of creation. So I have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump right in here. Father, we ask you to, uh, again, just help kind of, um, if anyone's tired or fatigued, like all of us guys from the men's retreat, just to... Lord, uh, awaken us, Lord, uh, certainly not just physically in terms of concentration, but spiritually, Lord, that we might hear from you this morning. And Lord, your word is powerful and active compared to uh, a surgical instrument that can penetrate our hearts. Lord, un unlike any other, uh, any other document, not just a historical portion of information, Lord, but uh, you can use it as such a life-giving message as we study it. We pray that you would do that this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Warren Wordsby says, a uh, great quote, he said, no scientist or historian can improve upon, in the beginning, God. The simple statement refutes the atheist who says there is no God, the agnostic who claims we cannot know God, the polytheist who claims we worship many gods, the pantheist who says that all nature is God, the materialist who claims that matter is eternal and not created, the fatalist who teaches that there is no divine plan behind creation and history. And that's where we began a few weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. In the beginning, God created, again, that Hebrew word for create, bara, create something out of nothing. And as we've seen and tried to point out, I think I gave you like six different views of, of creation when we were in those introductory verses, and now we followed up with the video series. Very well done, very recent. Uh, this last one, very good, taking what was about five or six uh, very, uh, uh, very well-known uh, scientists who at one time held a naturalistic or, or Darwinian evolutionary view of, of creation, this that's their problem, to get something out of nothing. How do you get that first cell? Uh, there is no naturalistic view that explains that. That's a, a dilemma for them. And of course, then the jump from one species to the next, very difficult. Geological record doesn't uh, bear it out. And then the uh, intricacy of design, even as we saw of a, with wonderful computer animation of a single protein cell, the uh, mechanics, uh, it's a little machine uh, and then it's got a manual and instructions that go along with it that tell it how to be built and how to be functioned. We refer to that as the, the DNA code. The complexity is unbelievable. Uh, and these things are, are problems if you believe in a closed system in that, uh, and you deny that there's anything of a metaphysical sense outside the time-space continuum. It uh, creates real problems and, of course, uh, the, there is great reason, as we've been seeing, for the idea of intelligent design. Uh, one of those scientists uh, who was the writer of college textbooks for uh, biochemistry, a uh, very well-known guy, and then he's uh, not really a Christian that I know of, but he is a theist now simply because of the evidence that in the beginning God creates something out of nothing. And uh, as uh, Warren Wordsby has said, refuting, in a sense, uh, the atheist and uh, the other worldviews that are out there. It's one of the things that's important that we see because we say that uh, Genesis is so foundational because uh, if we have in our view that God is the creator, uh, that uh, man is created, we say, imagio Dei, in the image of God, then that shapes our view of how we look at other people and how we view them and how we value them as well as uh, ourselves. And without that view... We have some very, very corrupted things that happen uh, within, uh, within our world historically and some of the things that happen uh, culturally in terms of society around the world today without that very important foundational view. Uh, and then we get to this issue today as we get man in the garden. We're not getting to uh, the idea of sin yet uh, coming into the world. Creation will still be in its perfection, man in that sense of perfect relationship with God, but he will be given a free will choice, another big foundational building block in terms of our worldview, so very important passage. Again, Moses giving us details about a specific place. It is referred to actually as the Garden of the Lord. It's in a geographic location known as Eden. 
But let's look at verses 4 to 7. Again, we're in chapter 2 of Genesis. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So this is another one of those uh, sections where we said we get to the Hebrew word uh, toledot, which means that uh, it's, uh, this is the generation. Uh, New King James, King James says this is the history, but it's the same word, we, uh, and that's going to change the subject matter as we, as we hit it. Uh, therefore, as we mentioned last week, those first three verses of chapter 2, the guy that decided chapters and verses in about the 16th century missed it. Uh, that section textually should have gone uh, with the uh, opening of creation, God creating the earth without, without form and void, and then the days of creation explaining how he brought form and then how he filled it. And then God rested on that seventh day, and we talked about the implications for us of, and what that means last week. But here we begin a, a, a new section once again. It is not a second creation account. It just simply now centers from the cosmos to a localized area, a garden east of Eden. So everything takes place in the text uh, there. Uh, it's very uh, just uh, one other little textual thing. It's in a classic Hebrew parallelism. Uh, you have a statement followed by a second statement repeated, and then the, fourth, the first statement repeated again. The heavens and the earth, uh, statement A, statement B, when they were created, bara, statement D, B again. When the Lord God made, uh, a different term but in the same meaning, and then the statement A is repeated, uh, the earth and the heavens. All that's to say that sometimes you get some, some of those that would hold that you've got an initial creation and uh, something went awry. And now you have a second creation, again, somehow trying to fulfill or get the text to match the geological record and so forth, the uh, uh, age of the universe. And, um, you know, again, I, I'm kind of what is called a young earther. I don't really hold those views. Uh, and people do that I love and respect, but the text just doesn't bear it out. The way that Moses wrote it, this thing all is grouped together, is just saying that God did create without form, without void, he filled it, he brought form, uh, he rested, and now here's a localized situation that I'm going to tell you about, obviously of uh, utmost uh, importance uh, as we begin uh, with a change in the way that Moses refers to God. Um, again in verse 4, uh, in the day, notice now it's Lord God made the earth. Verse 5, for the Lord God had not caused. Verse 7, and the Lord God formed man. Now, again, in that opening, stay with me here a little bit. It's going to get juicy in a second. But uh, this is <laughs> but uh, I know this is starting to sound like a uh, uh, college classroom in, uh, in that church. But uh, here, very importantly, again, we looked at that opening word for God, Elohim which uh, Moses could have used the word El, singular, God, singular, created. But he doesn't. He uses a compound plural name for God. Uh, now, again, to a Jewish here writer would say he did that for emphasis because of the majesty of God in creation. But from our perspective and what we know because of, uh, of Jesus, his teaching, the writers of the New Testament, we say we understand God exists in a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God but three persons. So therefore, he uses the word compound unity, which, as we saw last week, again, Elohim, very important. God is, when we read that, to again, to a Jewish audience reading it as we should read it and understand it, that's God the creator. Every time we see that word, God is the creator. But not only that, we saw that also that's the reference to, and he is the redeemer. He redeemed them from Egypt, from their slavery, from the bondage that they were under. With an outstretched arm and his mighty hand, he redeemed them. So every time we see the word Elohim, we remember God is the creator. There's a few people that have forgotten that, right? That God is the creator. He's also our redeemer. And that makes a lot of sense to us as New Testament or New Covenant believers, because ultimately we have our redemption through Jesus Christ. 
Now, now, Moses inserts another word here. He inserts uh, the word Yahweh. Now, again, no Jewish person would actually say it out loud. They just refer to God as the Lord because his name is too holy to actually be pronounced. And again, when Moses writes it, transliterated into English letters, Y-H-W-H, uh, later vowels are inserted, never in writing, not supposed to be pronounced. Oops, we're pronouncing that. We just take a shot at it and say it's Yahweh. Some people say Jehovah. What's the importance of that name? That's the covenant name of God in the relationship with the Jewish people. God comes along and establishes a relationship with Moses. And he says, as he appears before the burning bush, and Moses says, if I'm going to go and deliver the people out of bondage and slavery, <laughs> uh, by the way, what's your name? Who shall, I, who shall I say is sending me? And God says, I am that I am. I am the eternal one. I have always existed. I will always exist. This is the name by which you will know me and have a relationship with me through this covenant. So now Moses takes that name and says, you know, God has created the cosmos. We understand the idea of Elohim. But if he's going to talk about man, now he becomes Yahweh Elohim. He is the creator, he is our redeemer, and we have a relationship with him because of his promises to us. Now, we're under the new covenant, not the Mosaic covenant, but that still should uh, speak a lot to us. Every time you're reading, and it's there all the time, in the Old Testament, and you get to that capital H, L, capital O, R, D, that's how they spell out that name, Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, that's God. I have a relationship with him because of his promises to me, because of what he's done in establishing a relationship with me. And he is the creator and he is the redeemer. And, uh, you know, sometimes we say, you know, I read some of the stuff in the Old Testament. I don't get much out of it. We should get something now. <laughs> Just every time you come across that name, it's, it, it's, uh, it's precise. Uh, Moses has changed that here in particular. Now, it's interesting as we get to chapter three, just as a side note, is that when the serpent comes along and tempts Eve, he doesn't use that name. It's just, did God say? He goes back to Elohim. He's not going to say, did God say? Did Yahweh Elohim say? The one that has a relationship with you, the one that's made all the promises to you, the one that's your redeemer, the one that's your savior. Has he really said this? Satan really doesn't do that. And really, he's trying to twist God's word. We'll look at it more there. But it's interesting in context uh, when you have that scene of temptation, this name is left off because it should speak volumes, should have spoke volumes to her, to them uh, in that, that context. It's a personal covenant name of God who relates to and redeems his, his people. Second thing that's precise about this is the area of the garden as it comes into view. A couple of things that are mentioned there's something wrong here. There's a lot of no's. There's no plants. There's no herbs. There's no rain. There's no man to till the ground. Very much in a negative sense. But verse 6, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So this lack of rain, lack of herbs, lack of plants points to what we would call an unintended condition of the earth. And God, as we know through creation, remedies that. And then ultimately, the apex of that creation was creating God in his own image uh, and now he's going to place him very specifically into the garden. And we know that the precise conditions include uh, some very specific things about man. There's three of them. First, we note in creation, Adam is God formed. Notice the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. Form indicates uh, a careful design. Uh, it, uh, as one writer said, conveys divine intentionality. Man is no afterthought. It's not like God is up there and go, ah, hey, let's, uh, let's like do a universe today. What do you think? You know, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hey, it looks good. Let's kind of get something going down. I think we're missing something here. Let's just throw some little guy down there and see how we, that's not it at all. I mean, this whole thing is, and, and we'll see this from the video uh, on Wednesday night, our, our, uh, our universe is so precise in every measurement in order for life to be capable of here. It's what even the non-believer says, uh, apparent design. Sure looks like there's design. I just can't admit there's a designer. So I have to say apparent design. Uh, there's incredible design to our universe. It was all for a purpose. 
Adam uh, is formed uh, by God. He is no afterthought. Notice he's formed from the, uh, the dust. And there's a, uh, you can appreciate God's sense of humor here in the wording. Uh, it would say in the Hebrew, the Lord God formed man, ha-adam, of the dust from the ground, ha-adama. In other words, uh, the dust of, what's Adam's name? Dust of the earth. <laughs> nice to meet you, dust of the earth. Uh, how did God make you? Dust of the earth. You know, so there's a lot of little plays on words, in particular in Hebrew in the Old Testament. And uh, I think God's just trying to keep us entertained here. But that's, uh, I don't know if they called him Dusty for short or not. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe if you, well, we've got an Adam here. We might, we might give him a, a, a nickname, start calling him Dusty here. But uh, notice also, Adam is God-breathed. And he breathed in his nostrils. The breath of life, this speaks of uh, tremendous uh, intimacy in the process. As uh, one writer, Kidner, points out, breathe is warmly personal with face to face. The significance that this, is, that this was an act of giving as well as making and self-giving at that. Uh, the idea of breathe, uh, again, this, is, this word is the idea of a, a fire going out and you're trying to keep it going again and you're... <laughs> Trying to, trying to you know, breathe life into it. That's, that's the idea, is uh, God uh, gives life to the first man. Now, in Ezekiel's vision, later talking about Israel, Ezekiel the prophet, uh, again, prophesying the t fact that, that God's people, Israel, would go into a captivity and be dispersed to the four corners of the world, which, of course, did happen. He prophesied that they would be brought back to the nation once again, which did happen. And the way he describes it is in a similar metaphor in Ezekiel 37, 9. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath. Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And, of course, we know the rest of the, uh, the prophecies. And, and uh, we live in those days when uh, a miracle has occurred in terms of the nation of Israel being regathered back to the land once again since 1948. No other people group ever removed out of their homeland for more than just a, a few generations and remaining intact as a people group, much less being drawn back to that original homeland again unique in the history of man. But that same metaphor and uh, uh, illustration being used for them, giving life to them, is the way life being given to Adam is described. The third thing about uh, Adam and coming to life, Adam is a, is a living being. Notice, and man became a living being. Well, the creatures uh, also were living, similar makeup, uh, drawing their breath in the same way. But God breathed life into Adam very much unlike the animals, and we talked about some of those distinctions uh, previously. But again, man becomes uh, uh, immortal with uh, immense capabilities and therefore tremendous responsibilities. Great potential for glory, great potential for disaster is, uh, is, as well. Second thing about uh, our text, there's a, a placing of man actually in the garden in verses 18 to 14. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Again, Moses writing from Sinai, so it would be Easter from his geographic place of writing. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there is parted, it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. Uh, it is one of the uh, which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Where's that at exactly? <laughs> and the gold of that land is good. Uh, Bededalim and onyx stones are there. The name of the second river is Gihon, and it's one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is uh, Hidaki, Hidakel, it is one which goes towards the east of Assyria. The fourth river is uh, uh, Euphrates. So placed uh, in the garden by God, positioned there is, uh, I think, the point of the passage there in verse 8. 
and again the designation in Eden in the east. Now if you want to see the Garden of Eden, all you've got to do is go to a Middle Eastern country like Bahrain or some other place or Iraq and just tell a tour guide you'd like to see the Garden of Eden. They'd be happy to take your money, drive you out in the middle of the desert somewhere where there's a little bush, a little tree growing, a little sign that says Garden of Eden. There you go. Get out and get your picture taken. So still there. No, we don't really know, but we know the general vicinity because of the, the locations of the rivers themselves. But again, part of the Fertile Crescent more than likely, and probably in Mesopotamia, uh, what uh, would be modern Iraq. But secondly, he's placed in a garden that is uh, really a paradise. And uh, Isaiah uses, um, the prophet Isaiah speaks about uh, this, uh, the Eden and the garden of the Lord as well in these kinds of terms in Isaiah 51, three. For the Lord will comfort Zion, Israel, he will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. And what does he say about a place like that? Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving in the voice of melody. So uh, again, we you know, often describe, and most people even make reference to, with very no limited knowledge of the Bible, the fact that the garden of Eden was a, a, a paradise. Uh, again, we have the presence of uh, a river there flowing out, which uh, is an indication of something that is life-giving. The Hebrew word for Eden or Edan is uh, delight. Uh, verse 9, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant for sight and good for food. Adam lacked nothing. You know, fresh water is very important. And we did our tour of Israel. We saw a lot of the ancient cities and tells that were there. One of the things that was noted is that there had to be a water source, and from that water source, you've got a, a city, and from that city, then you've got a major thoroughfare or highway for transportation of goods and so forth, and that's, uh, that's true. There's, um, we know that from some of our other men's retreats. One thing to camp on that little atoll in the middle of uh, Kaneohe Bay, Kapapa Island, no fresh water supply. Got to take it with you versus when we would go to the big island and... Uh, and have a natural spring and a wonderful river that would come uh, through the valley that we would camp in. Very essential for life, and, uh, and we see it here. I think it was practical, but I think the text is speaking of a lot more than that. Adam lacked nothing. He had everything. Uh, the trees were beautiful, and many var variations of mango trees, of course, and uh, Miley is growing everywhere. It's not really in the text. It's just kind of... Uh, I think it imposes itself if you understand what good fruit is and what really smells and looks good, as we do here in, in Hawaii. But uh, it was a paradise for him. And as we get to this whole idea now of these two important trees and this moral dilemma faced by Adam of either obeying God or disobeying God, it's very important that we understand that there was no need for him to ever eat from the one tree that God said, don't eat from this tree, uh, the tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But the point is, God had provided everything he needs. Bonhoeffer says of uh, Adam that he speaks and walks with God as if they belong to one another. Wonderful phrase that uh, we don't want to miss the intimacy and the relationship. We talk about, <clears throat> as evangelical Christians, that because we uh, have our sins forgiven and we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior uh, and he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west, the barrier that kept us from knowing him and having a relationship with him, that we can have a personal relationship with him. And however wonderful and however glorious and whatever times we might have with the Lord and experience God's presence, have his word really speak to our hearts, minister to us in good times as well as desperate times. It is nothing in pale compared to the relationship that Adam has with God at this point. God pretty much just shows up and says, hey, let's just kind of go for a walk here and, and, uh, and talk to one another. And, and, uh, and there's an intimacy that's uh, there that is lost. And of course, uh, the rest of the Bible at that loss is a story about how God tries, tries to bring that back. Everything that Adam and Eve lose in the garden, then the rest of the Bible is a story about redemption of God giving everything that was lost back to mankind. 
was going to look at this idea of he's placed uh, in this garden with access to two trees, very important. Last half of verse 9, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. We might say, therefore, the middle. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Two trees standing side by side. And uh, very important because the destiny of all mankind would weigh in the balances with the free will choice and what Adam would do in terms of these two trees. So there is the tree of, um, of life, which... Um, apparently was able to uh, somehow help Adam sustain his life uh, for an indefinite period of time. And because they do sin, we'll look at that more in chapter 3, uh, they are then denied access to it. Remember that uh, uh, later in chapter 3, verse 24, God puts uh, uh, more than one angel referred to as cherubim. Again, the I-M means plural. So they are there with flaming swords to prevent them from coming back in the garden, having access to the tree. Because a great tragedy would have occurred if Adam's life could have been sustained uh, indefinitely. Uh, and uh, even though maybe he came and was restored, and I think we're going to see that in terms of his relationship with God, uh, and he's able to have a relationship with God, but without the ability to die and then resurrect, and be with God all eternity, there would be something terrible missing in the equation of what God meant and what we understand now through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they are prevented from the tree of life. It reappears again in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and verse 7. Uh, there Jesus speaking says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life. There it is again which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It's now in heaven. So there's something, obviously, this is not a normal tree of uh, uh, any stretch of the imagination. It uh, is then referenced again in chapter 22 and verses 2, 14, and 19. Uh, the life uh, of this tree uh, is, uh, in particular, gives uh, life, and it grows in eternity. In terms of uh, man being placed in the garden with a, an abundant water source, uh, here's what we, we do know in terms of uh, the proximate location of where Edom was. Uh, the river Pishon is uh, on the outskirts, verse 11, of the land of Havilah. Havilah is one of the sons of Cush. We'll get to all this later as we make our way through the generations. Who is a grandson to, of Noah. The river Gihon uh, is uh, around the whole land of Cush. Uh, again, Cush also is the father of Nimrod, whose empire covers most of Mesopotamia, the first world ruler, as we'll, uh, we'll see him in a few weeks. And uh, Hidekel is uh, one, uh, one that goes uh, towards the east of Assyria. Uh, that's a word that just means the Tigris River in Daniel, Daniel 10, 4. He uh, interchanges these two words. So it kind of gives us a good idea. We know where the Euphrates is today. Still one of the great rivers. So we don't know exactly uh, where the Garden of the Lord is, uh, but certainly in the Fertile Crescent uh, in that area of, of Mesopotamia. Now we have a, a good friend that we would visit when we would smuggle, take Bibles into China, and uh, pastor one of the large uh, house churches there, wonderful guy. He's uh, in his 80s now, and at one point in time, was uh, uh, imprisoned uh, for uh, his uh, being a pastor. That was his crime in communist China. It's been about 21 years uh, in uh, hard labor. You, you go to prison in China, you're not watching color TV. You know, he uh, worked in a coal mine for many years, loves to, speaks very, very good English, and uh, loves to tell you uh, about working in that coal mine. And, and he always says, see, 10 fingers, 10 fingers, 20 years, 10 fingers. Because when you connect coal, coal, uh, the cars all day long usually lose a few along the way so up near Siberia God kept him healthy and spared him and like some of the other guys that uh, that we've met uh, tremendous just full of the joy of the Lord despite what they've uh, they've been through uh, just a, uh, a wonderful uh, wonderful guy but he has a whole little booklet that he's written on the fact that uh, the Garden of e Chinese pastor the Garden of Eden was actually in China, of course. <laughs> He's got maps and detailed drawings and little word studies and, uh, and everything. But of course, uh, most of the uh, uh, Chinese Christians there will tell you also that even if it was located in China, one thing they know for sure is that Adam and Eve were not Chinese. 
because, uh, because if Adam and Eve were Chinese, original sin would never have occurred because they would have eaten the snake. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Kathy and I were sitting in a, a, little, a little cafe in a, a village that we were in. We had made a delivery to, and we were getting something to eat. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a little sidewalk down. Sure enough, here comes a guy walking in, holding his snake that's still wiggling, and he's on his way to the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, comes back without the snake and sits down across from us. And you know, about 15 minutes later, his lunch was served. Yeah, but it uh, uh, could be in China, probably Mesopotamia, though. But uh, either way, the perfect in, uh, environment for Adam uh, and, uh, and Eve. And of course, the, uh, our, our friends and Brothers there will also tell you that uh, God loves the Chinese people. That's why he made so many. But uh, let's go on to three. There are specific purposes for uh, man being in the garden. Very importantly, verse 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. So man's purpose included the responsibility in terms of care for the garden. And uh, a very interesting couple of key words here. Uh, the garden, you, you tend it, uh, you keep it, uh, which also means to guard it, suggesting the presence of an enemy. So we kind of have a misunderstanding, I think, sometimes of Adam and Eve in this garden. It was a paradise. It was a beautiful garden. They weren't like on vacation or semi-retired or just kind of kicked back or whatever. Uh, they had uh, responsibilities. I know people from Kailua can't really understand this. Uh, they've got people in Kailua have gardens and the soil is sand. And they're, they're, they're just like, you know, fertilizer and trying to make things grow and kind of get it going. But if you're from Kaneohe, you know, then you... You, you, you have things like Roundup and chainsaws and weed whackers because you're trying to kill it because <laughs> it wants to grow the jungle right through and it would just go right up over your house and down the other side. Uh, it's a little, I think, you know, it's a little misunderstanding this idea of perfect paradise or whatever. But uh, again, it's for, before the fall, but it's not that they didn't have anything to do. Uh, they had a, a lot of responsibility. Uh, and, uh, and part of it was apparently there's an enemy that is present in that garden and they need to guard and be on their guard. But also the man's purpose for being in the garden included very importantly, as we mentioned earlier, this foundational understanding of a free will choice. Verse 16, of every tree of the garden you may eat, freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. The word put and putting him in the garden describes uh, Adam uh, being placed there by God and it carries a nuance of rest, suggesting the connection to the Shabbat or the Sabbath rest. There's a rest in this in terms of the relationship and the perfect uh, situation. And God's first word to him we see is permissive of every tree. And they're all beautiful. And they all have great fruit. Of every tree you may eat, but there's also a prohibition. But there is a particular tree, uh, and you shall not eat from that. So God gives him a choice, or we say a free will choice. Adam was not intrinsically immortal. Uh, he, uh, he needed access to this one particular tree, the tree of life. Uh, and yet the temptation there is simply this, as Kent Hughes says, the temptation to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was to seek wisdom without reference to the word of God. To seek wisdom without reference to the word of God. Jesus would say later, facing his own temptation in Matthew 4, 4, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And we can, God gives us a choice to have a self-directed will, we say to do our, do our own thing. You know, Adam could sing that Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. But what, what did it get him? Well, there was a consequence to doing your own way, having a self-directed well, will, which is kind of, again, is the, the mantra of our day, right? I mean, we even use it to popularize fast food. You can go to McDonald's because you can have it your own way. I mean, and... You know, there used to be a very popular magazine when I was a kid growing up uh, in this country called Life. 
you know, and by, by the time I was uh, in college, there was another popular magazine called People. And now a very popular magazine is called Self. They actually, that's the name of the magazine, Self. And uh, we've become much more um, myoptic uh, in our view of, of me and my happiness and what I want and what I get and what's good, which is not good. And it's not good for me. Uh, and, uh, and the people that seek out to live that way and so forth are not happy campers uh, in the end. Uh, and uh, I mentioned uh, our good friend Samuel Lamb, but the, the people that I've met and know and read about are the people that are out there giving their lives away to other people. It doesn't matter if they're uh, in Cambodia, where they might be. They're, they're out intrinsically understanding what Jesus said in terms it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's true for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. That's just a, a truism by the way God created us. And there's something that brings death in our lives when we try to seek some wisdom apart from uh, the will and the word of God with reference so that we can understand life and what life's about, what real meaning to life is. And there's a, there's a tremendous temptation here for Adam and Eve. Uh, it's at the very heart in terms of this rebellion against God uh, in terms of what we call original sin. Uh, Adam did not obtain or did obtain the knowledge of good and evil, and it killed him And uh, because he got his way. He got wisdom his way, uh, and uh, it was to his detriment and ours, uh, of course, uh, and of course, this is all very interesting in the uh, era of postmodernism that we live in, where everybody wants to be autonomous and have their own authority and, uh, and so forth. But the best thing that can ever happen to us is actually to come under the authority uh, of God, uh, which all begs the question, why does God allow Adam and Eve to have a free will choice? And it's simply that's the only way where there could be any valid love, which is the reason that he created them that he created us he wants to have a relationship he wants us to understand who he is his character that we might grow and understand and learn to love him and worship him uh, and of course he he could have created robots and just programmed us to i love god i love god you know like a, a doll that you pull the string uh, and uh, you know there's no valid love to the person that has a gun at their head and says do you love my daughter yes i do sir I think she's the most beautiful person I've ever seen. Good. That's, that's not a, a real valid love, obviously. There's only a valid love if there's a valid choice. And God gives it to Adam and Eve. Of course, then that begs the question that some maybe you've been confronted with. If a God is a God of love, why does he allow suffering in this world? And the answer to that question is he has allowed suffering in this world as a result of having given mankind a free will choice. Why does he give him a free will choice? It was the only valid way for us to have the ability to love him or not love him. Well, if that free will choice is evil and God gave it, then God must be evil. No, free will choice is neutral. As we heard Dr. Zuckerman uh, explain a few weeks ago in one of our conferences that uh, he used the example, I could uh, be working late at the office uh, give one of the young guys that doesn't have a car, give him the keys to my new car and say, hey, why don't you run down and get us a pizza and something. We'll, we'll have dinner here tonight as we keep working. And that person could go and speed and wreck his car and do any number of things. Now, was his car keys evil? No, his car keys are simply just neutral. That person could have used them for pleasure, for enjoyment, done what he was supposed to do, or he could use those car keys for evil, which in the illustration he did. Free will choice is not evil, it is neutral. God gives it to us, we must decide what we do with it after that. God is good, he is not evil, he has allowed evil in this world because and suffering in order to give us a free will choice. Man then through his free will choice which is neutral, has brought evil into this world. God is working to the extreme of sending his son to die on a cross for our sins to save us out of this world that we might be redeemed and restored for everything that was lost in this decision by Adam and Eve. Paul says in writing to the Romans that, that uh, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. In this way, death came to all men because all sinned. 
Are you sure all sinned? I'm pretty sure everybody's dying. And, and, that, and that's his point. That's how it comes in. Uh, and uh, in, in, uh, very interesting, in a Hebrew, again, translated in, transliterated into English, uh, the text actually says, In the day that thou eatest thereof, dine, thou shalt die. So there's, uh, when he eats of this fruit, he uh, and, uh, and Eve, and we'll look at that in a few weeks, they begin a process of decay and dying. Now, we know that Adam lives 930 uh, 30 years. Does that make you feel like a young man, Charlie? Charlie's only, <laughs> Charlie's only 97. I mean, he's like a spring chicken compared to, compared to Adam. But uh, in dying, a death process began that culminated in his physical death, but he died that day, she died that day spiritually. Uh, it ended. And, then, and therefore, we understand some of the words of Je Jesus, like to Nicodemus, that you must be, be born again, or you won't see the kingdom of God there in John 3. Now, Nicodemus, this made no sense to him at all. I mean, he is the rabbi of, uh, of Jerusalem, of Israel. He's the rabbi, head rabbi. Comes at night to see Jesus, and Jesus tells him, you must be born again. Very familiar phrase. <laughs> Nicodemus had been born again every week. A Jewish man could be born again. You're born again when you're bar mitzvah. He had done that. You're born again when you're married. He had done that. You're born again when you become part of a rabbinical school. He had done that. You're born again when you become the head of a rabbinical school. He had done that. So he says, how can I be born again? Would I, have to, I would have to get my mother's womb a second time to be born again. And Jesus says, no, again, you need to be born again spiritually because we, he lost it. We lost it when Adam, death came into his life. In death, you shall die. He died, and it was progressive physically, but he died right then spiritually. And again, everything that is lost, that we see these building blocks to our thinking and worldview that are so important here in Genesis, one of them is the fall of man and sin coming into this world. And uh, important that we understand that sin separates us from God. We have a problem. It's a spiritual problem. It's remedied through God and his his redemption that he offers us through Jesus Christ. That's the way he resolves the problem, but it must be resolved in this lifetime. That's our opportunity to come back and gain back all that was lost in terms of the original sin, the consequences of that free will choice of Adam and Eve. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that, um, that you would even care as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, as we sing often, we love because you first loved us, because we're pretty incapable and maybe didn't even know what true sacrificial love is until we understand what it is that you've done for us. Lord, and we're so thankful you provided the remedy for our situation, that yes, you give us free will choice, you don't make us love you, you don't make us worship you, but you give us the opportunity placed Adam in the perfect situation and yet they still chose to kind of do their own thing and have it their own way and have that self-directed will but Lord what a glorious thing when we come to know you and understand your character and how we can trust you and how because you created us and made us in your image and you have a plan for us Lord when we submit to you and follow you that's when life begins to make sense. That's when life becomes exciting. Lord, and that's when there's such great comfort and peace in our own souls as we can come to rest, true rest, in you. Lord, so we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you that you've given us a text that lays it out so, so precise and so, so logically. And Lord, we just pray that you'd continue to use it to strengthen our faith, build us up, Lord, so that we might trust you even more and more in the days ahead. Thank you for your love and your mercies that are new every morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.